All right. I think we're live. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to Ghost, Kathy Patrick, and Saki. I think that's how you pronounce it. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome into the stream. Glad you came in a little early. Glad to see everyone here. So hello, hello to everyone. Um, today, we're not only going to be drawing today. Hello, Gigi. Welcome in. Um, today, we're not only going to be drawing today. If you've ever watched... Hi! Hi, Ghost. If you've ever watched any of our Elements of Art videos, we're kind of switching up the formula. So there are going to be smaller... Port, uh, smaller and... Call me Adam. All right. Hello, Adam, then. Welcome in. Um, so... Hello, Thunder Beast. Welcome in. Um, so if you've ever watched any of our Elements of Art videos, um, which are also kind of helmed by me, we're switching up the formula a little bit. Um, so instead of, you know, just having the minimal kind of video, we're also going to be doing a live stream about it. Um, actually, early for once. Yes, I'm glad that you are. Um, so we're going to be doing a live stream about it as well that will be condensed later into a shorter video. But I decided, you know, um, kind of make it a little more fun to do the Elements of Art videos. Hello, TameFX. Welcome in. Um, but we're switching it up for the principles of design. So there are 10 of them. So we're going to do about 10 live streams. I think 10. 10 or 9. Um, live streams about these guys, which are kind of like, if you think of the Elements of Art as the main baseline, you can kind of think of the principles of design as almost the kind of like the support. Also super, super important, but you can think of it as like the extra support. Right? A little bit different, but Still super, super important. So we're going to go over that today. Don't worry, the, um, what's it called? The formula is going to be about the same. You know, we'll start off with the lesson portion and then we'll get into the actual illustration because we are going to be, I'm going to be doing an illustration that will relate um, or that will show off the principle that I will be talking about today. Hello, Dudu. Welcome in. Um, but before we get started, to our little plugs. If you didn't know, our growing if you didn't know, our growing community is filled with tons of art nerds, and we art nerds have to stick together. So if you're an art nerd too, be sure to check the links to the social. Be sure to check out the links to our social media, which are in the description below, and check out our website for our class offerings because we're not just a YouTube channel; we're an art school too. So if you'd like to support us, so we can keep making free content, consider supporting us on Patreon, where you can get access to tons of perks like my working files, critique sessions, and a huge discount on our classes that have a limited amount of spots, so be sure to check those out before they are gone. All right, I'm really hyped. I'm hyped too. This is going to be a fun kind of new new, um, new format because guess what? I planned. Strange. I never do that. <laughs> um, and hello, Emma. Welcome in. And hello, Katone. Welcome in. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, oh, whoops. Still on the Patreon thing. There we go. Switch that off. So, contrast. What is contrast, right? Um, our friend Google states that contrast refers to the arrangement of opposite elements and effects. For example, light and dark colors, smooth and rough textures, large and small shapes, etc., etc. Contrast can be used to create variety, visual interest, and drama in an artwork, right? So if we have our contrast, you know, they're pretty much just opposites. What is contrast? TLDR. Opposites. Right? Contrast can be summarized as opposites, right? Most of the time, people use contrast to emphasize stuff, right? But most of the time, it will also just be opposites, right? If you have like two contrasting colors, you have two contrasting shapes, whatever, they're most likely going to be opposites or just two different things, right? Hi, Jesse. I hope I'm not forgotten. Of course, you're not forgotten. Hello, Wolf Luna. Welcome back in. Um, Ragu, welcome in as well. And Amaya is here joining us as well as our um, lovely mod for today. So what is contrast? TLDR, the, the opposites, right? I'm not going to write down the whole friend Google definition. You can find it if you Google it. Um, but yes, often contrast is used in tandem with the elements of arts, right? So often contrast is very heavily linked heavily linked to the elements nope elements of art 
right? We talked about if you ever watched our past color live stream, you'll hear, you know, I, I already kind of talked about contrast in there. So there was like high contrast and low contrast. Oh, no, that was va value. That's right. I talked about contrast a lot with value because contrast is very, very heavily linked to value and color. Um, Google, our best friend. Yes, it is. Hello, Yuri. Welcome in. Um, Yuri is one of our lovely instructors. Um, yes, contrast, super, super effective, you know, to um, add emphasis. Emphasis is another principle of design, which we'll go over later. Um, but... Contrast is great for showing off your focal points. It's great for showing off, you know, um, areas where you want viewers' eyes to lead to. But I also mentioned that contrast is very heavily linked to the elements of art. So let's talk about that a little bit, right? So let's just not just talk about contrast itself because you kind of get it, right? Contrast is like, you know, if you have two kind of opposing colors, you have two kind of opposing shapes, or maybe it's more than two, right? Most of the time it's just two, but maybe you have more than just two, right? So let's talk about contrast in relation to the elements of art. So let's talk about contrast with color and value. Contrast. Actually, let's do it this way with color and value. Right, they're very heavily linked. Color and value are very heavily linked um, elements to begin with, right? Value is like how light and dark something is. Um, color is like, you know, color. <laughs> so they're very, very highly linked to each other. So it only makes sense that contrast is also very highly linked to those two, right? They all kind of have to do with um, color and whatnot. But, you know, contrast can be used with more than just color. It's just the more, most popular one. So often... Contrast with color and value is using opposing colors and values to add emphasis. So using, yes, yes, using opposing colors and values to add emphasis. And emphasis is a principle of design and emphasis is just kind of like where your eyes are supposed to go you know how you're supposed to lead your eyes into somewhere right that's your emphasis so color and value often go hand in hand together that's what I mentioned right color and value are very very closely linked to one another so let me write that down to you. Color and value are very closely linked. Right, so you can kind of group them in together, right? There's a lot of different elements and principles. Like, all of them have to be used together in order to make, like, something cohesive, but a lot of them you can kind of link together, right? Shape and form or two you can kind of link together. Um, color, value, contrast, saturation, all of those you can kind of link together as well. They're all very, very similar in terms of, like, what they control. All right, so color and value are very closely linked, which is why they're kind of linked up here. And often... Contrast relates to the color palette. Hi, I'm late, but I'm here. You're not too late. We just started, but welcome in Kiara Draws. Glad to have you in. Often relates to color value very closely linked. Often relates to color palettes or palettes. Palettes and color theory. Whoops, but not always. Right, so then that's often complementary. Right, so you, sh you should um, go back to see the color video <laughs> if you don't, if you haven't watched it yet. Um, but often, you know, with contrast, you know, it's our complementary colors that are used the most, right? So you have your green and uh, green and red or blue and orange. Blue and orange is a really popular one. And purple and yellow. Um, blue and orange is what I call the concept artist's colors. Every concept artist uses blue, blue and orange. Like if you just look up game video game concept art, 
90% of it will be like blue and orange. Like it's so strange. You can just look it up. You'll find it. <laughs> um, but they love their contrasting colors, right? Contrasting values. And complementary colors are very, very contrasty. Um, but, you know, it doesn't have to be a complementary palette in order to be contrasted, right? That's the best one you can use, but not necessary, right? If you have an entirely, like, blue piece, and then there's one section that's, like, red or one section that's purple, that thing is going to still stand out. That's still contrast. It won't be as heavily contrasted as if you use orange, per se, but it is still a contrasting color because it's something different than what the majority is, right? Opposites. Kind of adds that emphasis back in. I feel like a teacher getting greeted by students, even though I'm the student here. <laughs> it's okay. It's good to have, like, I like to build this community, you know? <laughs> After all these streams, I'm no longer seeing myself as self-taught artist, only I over learning so much. You're self-taught if it's your own. I How I see it is if it's an institution teaching you, that's you kind of learning from somewhere else. But if you're kind of taking the initiative to learn for yourself, that's self-taught, right? That's how I've always seen it anyway. So I still think you're pretty self-taught, if you have the initiative to do so. Right, so that's contrast with color and value. But I'm not ending it there. Yes, we have examples. Don't worry, we've all got examples. We're not just talking like this. You've got examples too. So, my example for color is Knives by Andy Warhol. Now, this piece, Knives by Andy Warhol, I think it was 19... Oh, God, 1960-something. Um... <laughs> So the contrast in this, kind of obvious, right? It uses yellow and black, which are like, um, from what I've heard, are the easiest to read contrasted colors, right? If you've ever wondered why, um, if you've ever watched anime, you notice how most of the time the subtitles are either yellow or white with a black outline. Or if you read subtitles from somewhere else, they're most likely going to be in yellow. That's because yellow is a very standouty color, apparently. So it's like, it's very easy to read if you have black against yellow. I have such a huge backlog because I'm kind of new here. My finals are coming up, so I'm building a huge mountain of streaming lessons. Yes, good. Join us. And oh, obviously, it's very easy to see the harsh contrast between the black knives and the yellow background, right? It's very, very harsh, right? The values. If I were to make this... Oh, yes, I can. I can do my trick. So, digital artists, if any of you are digital artists, one thing that you can do to ever check your values is if you create a new layer... Paint bucketed all in white. Oh, reference the layer. Paint bucketed all in white. Oh, this should be above in here. Yes. And then change this to color. There we go. And now you can kind of see your accurate values, right? If you have this white layer. So you can even see the values, right? These values, super contrasted, right? You have the super light gray in the background, but contrasted with this like black. It's just black, right? If I color pick this, it's like a super, super dark gray. And up here, super, super light gray, right? So this is super, super high contrasty, right? A very contrasty piece. If I turn off that color layer, it like flashes you in the face. <laughs> My Wi-Fi keeps turning off. Sag, oh. That sucks. Hi, Lola, I'm here. Hello, Xanthia, welcome in. We're just looking at Andy Warhol's artwork. Right, so you can kind of see those values super, super contrasted, and you can see those colors super, super contrasted. All right, what's the next portion? Next one is contrast. With shape, form, and line. Right, and I mentioned earlier that shape and form are pretty similar already. But why is line there, right? Why is line here? Oops. Why? Why is line here? Often, line is used in tandem. Oh my god. Line is used in tandem with the shape and form. 
art hack. I never knew how to use make grayscale before. Also, I feel bad for distracting Jesse, so I'm going to be an attentive student now. It's okay. I like distractions. Um, often line is used in tandem with shape and form. Uh, often line is used in tandem with shapes and forms, especially with line art. Actually, in the form of line art. By the way, sorry I've not been in streams for a couple of weeks. That's because I had most rusty, crusty, dusty Wi-Fi in the world. Love your art, by the way. Thank you. And that's all good. Wi-Fi? Wi-Fi sucks. I'm just... <laughs> Shape and form in the form of line art. Often used, or usually used, uh, usually used to emphasize. I have I have notes off to the side, by the way. That's why I'm kind of like <laughs> reading a little bit. Usually used to emphasize forms. Love the art. You always motiv motivate me. Thank you, Dr. Xenox, and welcome in. Um, so contrast with shape, form, and line. So why is line here, right? I already mentioned shape and form. Very, very linked, but why is line here? So often line is used in tandem with shape and form in the form of line art. So it's usually used to emphasize the forms, right? If you've ever, I like to do this a lot. If you've ever seen a lot of artists, um, if you were here for the line art stream, uh, you remember that I say that the silhouette is a very, very important portion of your line art, right? And oftentimes artists will use um, much bolder line work on the silhouette of um, the main character or the focal point of the piece, right? So your lines are very, very heavily linked with your shapes and forms, in this case with contrast, right? Because you want your focal point. Uh, if you don't know a focal point is the thing that your eyes need to go to first, right? It's what you want to emphasize and emphasis. Emphasis, I think, is the most, like... Um, crucial principle of design. It's funny that we're not doing it first, but um, often, you know, we use these super bold, dark line art to emphasize our main portions, right? Our main forms, so our eyes go to it first, right? So that's kind of why we do it. That's why it's here, right? Sometimes... It's linked to detail. Right, sometimes our shape and form and line are linked to detail, right? Sometimes we have super, super detailed line work in one area and then not detailed line work in another area, right? Depending on whichever is less, right? So say if we have a super detailed piece and then a couple of very non-detailed um, figures, those non-detailed figures are going to stick out, right? Um, same with shapes and forms, right? If we have a lot of tiny, tall, kind of tiny, intricate forms and shapes around a very simple thing, then that simple thing is going to stick out. Same thing if it's reversed, right? If you have a very simple background and then something very detailed um, somewhere around in that scene, that um, very detailed thing is going to stick out against the uh, low detail, right? Contrast isn't necessarily always with your elements and principles, but it's easier to explain that way. It's just as long as it's opposites, right? 90% of the time it's opposites. Sometimes it's linked to detail, but more often than not, it's linked to size. And subject matter. More often than not, your contrast with your shape and form and line will be linked to your size and your subject matter. I don't know why I put a period there. Oh, no, I didn't. Um, more often than not, it's going to be linked to your size and your subject matter. So if two, if you have like one giant thing and then a bunch of little things, you know, uh, the big giant thing is going to seem the most juxtaposed, right? Or the most contrasty, the most um, emphasized, right? And again, again, vice versa. If something is very small, surrounded by very big things, the very small thing is going to be sticking out, right? And sometimes it's subject matter, right? If you have a bunch of, um, let's say you got like a forest, a lot of trees, a lot of foliage, and then you have a lamppost, that lamppost is going to stick out, right? A very man-made form versus a very organic forms around it. Those are two very contrasting things. Man-made and organic are very, very contrasty things that artists like to point out a lot. Um, especially environmental um, activists, you'll see them kind of 
um, juxtapose and contrast those two things a lot. So those are two things that ooh, those are two things that are very very common. You could also link it to 3D forms and 2D forms. So 3D shapes versus 2D or 3D forms versus 2D shapes. That's right. So 3D three dimensional shapes or forms, two dimensional shapes or shapes, right? So if you have like say you have a lot of 3D forms around and then you have a couple 2D form 2D shapes, you know the 2D shapes are gonna stick out and then vice versa, same deal. But all of this can be linked to juxtaposition. Especially this one, right? Especially when it comes to subject matter. Oops, subject matter. So often, if you don't know what juxtaposition is, juxtaposition is when you put two opposing things next to each other to kind of, um, you know, symbolize something or to kind of bring attention to a subject that you want to talk about, right? So if you have two ju juxtaposed, like, um, things, right? So like I mentioned, man-made versus organic, those are two very juxtapositioned, juxtaposed, um, elements, right? Um, I brought it up in the texture video. There was one portion. Somebody had done, uh, oh my god, um, object, some, did you know, Fourier, something like that? Uh, that one is very juxtaposed because, you know, you have, like, this fur fuzzy texture on a piece of, on, like, dinnerware. You shouldn't have fuzzy spoons. I'm just saying that. That's, that's not great. <laughs> but it's very juxtaposed, right? Two very contrasty things that should not be next to each other, right? But usually juxtaposition is meant to kind of create a point. So that's why um, a lot of environmentalists like to use juxtaposition. A lot of activists like juxtaposition and stuff like that. Right, so my little example for shape and form is this piece. Oh my goodness. No, I don't remember the name. Um, I think it's Stand Up Hero. Oops. Stand Up Hero by Hikari Shimoda, right? Yes, Stand Up Hero by Hikari Shimoda, right? And this piece um, is very, very contrasty, right? Your eyes, it doesn't seem very contrasty because there's so many colors around here, right? But your eyes automatically go to this figure in the middle. Couple of reasons why. There's a reason, number one is that it's directly in the middle, right? Your eyes are going to go there first. But second of all, look at how dark and look at how sharp and clean and thick these lines are, right? It automatically kind of draws your eyes to it because this whole area around this piece, you know, super, super high detail. There's so much stuff here. You can zoom in real quick and you notice all the, they're all little stickers actually, right? They're all like little stickers. I believe they're all poured on resin. So this is painted and then everything in the background is done with stickers and resin and everything, right? Um, and there's text all around it. It's very, very high detailed in the background. But this main sticker, dang, that's dope. I love this piece. I love this artist. Um, but the main figure in the center is very, very low detail. It's very simple, right? It's a very simple looking character, but the background, super high detail, right? Those are two very, very contrasty things. And this lines, these lines really emphasize, including the little highlights around here, they really emphasize all of these forms and makes it stick out against the super, super high, busy details in the background, right? There's so many colors. There's so much going on, <laughs> right? And, you know, a lot of your teachers will tell you not to do that. And honestly, if you do it right, then it's fine. I don't care, right? Um, but yes, this is a gorgeous piece. I do love this one. A lot of Ikari Shimoda, Shimoda's work is gorgeous. Um, if you want to look it up for yourself, the artist name, um, Ikari Shimoda. If you connect those two, um, into one word, then you'll find their Instagram. They're great work. It's great stuff. Um, I have yet to buy a t-shirt from them, but I will. I will buy their merch one day. <laughs> um, but yes, they're a wonderful artist. I love looking at their stuff. Um, it's all super, super cool. But yeah, so that's contrast with shape and form. Oh, I'm going to have to make this bigger. Shape, form, and line. So if you're wondering, this intro section is going to be a little bit longer compared to past live streams, but I'll try to still keep it within the hour and not take an hour. <laughs> These next two are a little bit uh, shorter. So contrast and texture, contrast and texture. Contrast with texture. I kind of brought this up in the texture video because uh, with like impasto and all of that, right? So contrast with texture, 
is very heavily linked to high detail versus low detail. So while contrast with shape, form, and line is very lightly related, high detail versus low detail is very, very heavily related with texture, right? Oftentimes you'll have, you know, some um, textures, like very, very textury, right? If it's very, very bumpy or very, very rough or whatever, and it'll usually be contrasted with very, very smooth or very, very soft, right? If you have very rough textures, like say if you had like a couple rocks in the sun, Oh my goodness. Say if you had a couple of rocks in the center of a piece and then it was surrounded by like fur or like soft seaweed or something. That's very, very contrasty in terms of texture, right? Maybe if you had a bunch of fabric and then like a couple little, and some sand in the middle, right? That's contrasty and that's a lot of texture, right? So high detail versus low detail is very often done with that and different kinds of texture. Different textures right so you have your opposite textures but even if you just have a different texture that's enough right if you had it's the same deal with everything right as long as you have like two kind of opposed textures um then you'll have you know your two different things right so you have your um different textures so if you just had like if you had like um, rocks versus eggshells. The eggshells are smooth. It's not completely opposite, but like it's opposite enough, right? Cause you, you kind of have it there. If you have fabric com next to like wood, right? Not completely opposite, but still contrasted enough, right? But all in all, again, still linked to juxtaposition, right? Same with the Murray Oppenheim, um, their piece with like the fuzz, <laughs> the fuzz on the on the cups, right? That's still very, very juxtaposed and contrasty, right? So again, texture. Here's another Rembrandt piece, right? I'm gonna constantly bring up Rembrandt. I love his work. It's all like, I love like very high contrasted values. So like, um, I'm gonna bring up a lot of Rembrandt's work. So this is the man with a golden helmet, hel whoa. This is the man with a golden helmet painted by Rembrandt in, in 1650 right not 1950 hasn't been around for a long <laughs> he hasn't been around for a long time um so the man with a golden helmet painted by rembrandt in 1650 right so uh like i mentioned in the texture video right first of all your eyes immediately go here right this beautiful gorgeous detailed helmet and like i mentioned in the texture video often rembrandt used very um use a lot of impasto with his lighter colors. So around here is a lot of impasto, right? There's a lot of impasto here. If I were to zoom in on this, which I can't over here, but I do have a different image. So if you kind of zoom in on here, this isn't super high res, but it's what I got. <laughs> um, all of these little areas are all done with impasto. So it is all, this would be raised. If you were to touch it, you would feel all the bumpy textures, right? But the rest of the piece is very, very thin paint, right? So you won't, it'll be all smooth kind of around here, right? But here, very textury, right? So you have your bumpy texture versus your very smooth texture, right? High contrasted, right? So it is all super, super contrasty in terms of that. And the last one that I'm gonna talk about and I'll actually bring up something that I realized I forgot to say in the beginning. <laughs> um, because I've said it in the color video as well. but Or the value video. But I'll say it again. Um, contrast and space. Alright, so this is linked to how objects are placed. How objects are placed. I love this artist, Jesse, all the time and mentioning an artist. I love artists, dude. You can't, <laughs> I can't gatekeep artists. I just love them all. Actually, that's a lie. I have a few that I don't like, but that's why I'm not going to use them as examples. <laughs> How objects. You can have opinions, guys. How objects are placed. How much negative space? All 
Right, so with contrast in space, most of the time is how objects are placed and how much negative space is between each thing, right? So how much negative space is used, right? Usually a lot of the time your negative space is a great way to add contrast to your piece, right? If you have your, um, so this is more of a photography thing. If you have your main subject in focus and then all of your negative space is all blurred, that's a very easy way to add contrast and a very easy way to make something stand out. Right, so how objects are placed, how much negative space is around the person, right? If you don't have a lot of negative space, things can get very busy very fast, right? If, a, if there's too much detail around everything, if everything has too much detail, your contrast is going to be very, very low, right? Your low contrast. And it can be very, very difficult to spot your main subject with all that detail. If you don't have something that's contrasted, it can get very difficult to um, point out a main figure. And that can make your piece feel busy and a little bit... Um, unprofessional I guess <laughs> right a little bit a little bit hard to read and so how objects are placed how much negative space is there and how much space does one object take up versus the rest the rest. So this is linked to size. Alright, so if you've got a big honking elephant with a bunch of tiny birds surrounding it, right? It's taking up more space than those birds are, and you'll be able to see it a little bit more, right? And then if you had a big bunch of big honking elephants and then one tiny little bird, you'll kind of look at the bird first, right? Because you'll kind of see that tiny little bit of space where everything else is kind of large, right? So that's often linked to size. But all in all, Space is often linked with everything else. All right, it's a little hard to talk about space on its own because space is usually just linked with everything, right? If you kind of have like if you have um, a little bit less of one color taking up space compared to a different color, then, you know, that little bit of color is going to um, stand out a little bit more. If you have, you know, um, thicker line art that's taking up more space, or if you have um, a different kind of form that seems to be taking up uh, a certain amount of space, which contrasts with everything else, right? Space kind of just links in with everything. It has its little ties and everywhere, right? So it's a little bit hard to talk about <laughs> on its own, but... You know, it's there, and we kind of need it, right? And our last little example that I will talk about, which is most likely going to be, our, my last example is usually always the modern one, right? So I don't know how many of you know this game. This game is called Kids, <laughs> right? It's kind of hard to Google. It was so hard to Google this image. I had to Google, like, the whole uh, game description. So if you look up, um, oh my goodness, I think it's... You can find it on Steam. It's the same people who made Plug and Play, right? Which was kind of, it was a game that kind of went viral back, like, uh, mid-2010s, right? Mid-2010s, early 2010s, right? It was called Plug and Play. It's the same developers. Um, and this game, they're all very surreal, all very strange, simplistic in nature. They only take about 15 to half, 15 minutes to about a half hour to play. Um, I don't know how much they cost, but they are on Steam. Um, and it's a surreal experience. No one ever really knows what's going on um, <laughs> if you play any of these games, so kids or Plug and Play. Um, but what's fun about this game is that it really uses you're only ever controlling one person, but everyone looks exactly the same. So what they do is they use space to kind of make this, to make it known who you're playing as, right? Every single person in this little, in this uh, screenshot here looks exactly the same, right? But they use space to kind of show you who the main person is, right? So this is the GIF of the gameplay, right? So you can kind of see like when you move, the space around this character moves with them right so the character will be running and everyone else around them will kind of part right part around this character right it's very very interesting it's a strange game um i don't know how many people oh amaya i think <laughs> recognizes it but yeah this is a bit of an older game um but they use space to kind of emphasize it all it's very interesting <laughs> I saw this picture went plug and play and was wrong. It was cl proud to be close. Yes, it, this was like the sequel kind of thing. This was their second one that wasn't quite as popular, but also very, very surreal, very strange. 
yeah, this game and plug and play are both great. I love both of them. They're so weird and conceptual, and I'm so I'm so in I'm so into that. I love that kind of stuff. Um, I'm just confirming what Kiara has said earlier. It's just like I love this. It's so great, right? <laughs> like what I say all the time. Mind you, that video where there's a lot of creepers and everyone runs from a cat. Ah, Minecraft. I understand. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of it for when I'm talking about contrast in terms of all of these. But I realized I forgot a very crucial <laughs> thing that I should have talked about. I guess I didn't talk about it because I already talked about it in the value video. Um, but I will talk about it again. So high contrast... And low contrast. All right, so high contrast are when they're very opposite. And low contrast is when they're fairly similar. All right, that's the TLDR version. That's me trying to find my mom in a superstore. Me. <laughs> Thank you, Yuri. <laughs> um, so high contrast versus low contrast. So high contrast is when things are very, very opposite to each other. Again, those contrasting colors, those contrasting textures, um, stuff like that. Right? High contrast. Low contrast is when things are fairly similar. Right? If we took that um that game, the now I've forgotten the name. Kids. <laughs> if we take that kids game, uh, if like. If they didn't have that space around that person, it'd be hard to figure out who you're playing as, <laughs> right? Very low contrast with every single one of those characters, right? If things are very, very similar, right? If you use, like, a light blue and a dark blue, those are kind of low contrast, right? <laughs> I guess it depends on how light and dark it is. If you have two very similar blues, right? That's low, low contrast, right? So most of the time, low contrast, you want to avoid it. Right, and high contrast is what you want if you want to have like a main subject, but use them wisely because sometimes you can use low contrast very, very well to create like something really cool. Like all the examples that I showed you guys, these are all very high contrast, right? So every single example here has very high contrast. Um, actually, this one's kind of in between, it depends on how you think about it, but all of them have pretty high contrast. So Explanation done. Fantastic. So we can get to the illustration portion. Now, if I remember correctly, let's see if I do remember correctly. If I remember correctly, because we did vote on what kind of contrast we wanted to see today. Was it color, that one? Yes, it was. Contrast with color is the one, that one. All right, so I will be demonstrating contrast by using color. Give me a second. I realized I messed something up. Okay. There we go. Cool. So, we are going to be drawing a piece that kind of contrasts by using color, right? We're going to be using some colors today. And because, you know, it's the concept artist's favor to use blue and Blue and orange. I'm going to use blue and orange too. <laughs> so I'm kind of feeling that oh, this should actually be at the bottom. Oh no. This should actually be at the bottom. So we were thinking that for the entirety of this um, series, right? The what's it called? The different kinds of art. Right, we were kind of, or the principles of design, that's right. We were thinking that, you know, when we did our, like the ending piece, we're going to have them all kind of themed. So they're all going to be fairly similar, or they're going to have a similar motif, right? And I guess what better way, you know, what better motif to have throughout every single piece than Kirby. <laughs> so for every single principle of design, I will be drawing a different Kirby piece, right? To get my Kirby fix. And you know, because everyone seems to like it when I draw Kirby on this channel. So <laughs> we will be doing a different kind of intense Kirby piece for every single um, 
principle of design. So because we are going to be using color, we're going to be focusing mostly on light and contrasting colors or complementary colors. So for some reason, when I kind of thought of this, I was thinking of like Kirby carrying around a torch in the woods or something. I know that there's fire Kirby. I know that he can like eat fire and like he'll be, he'll turn into like this, like this fire creature, but like I don't, I'm not feeling it. So <laughs> I kind of want to draw Kirby walking in the woods. Yes, we get more Kirbys. Yes. Everyone on this channel seems to like when I draw Kirby. So I'll be drawing Kirby every single time that we do one of these. So I'm going to be focusing very, very heavily on lighting. I actually, I remember seeing that some people actually really wanted to see light with a candle um, when we did the lighting stream. Now, unfortunately, I can't really give you lighting with a candle, but hopefully lighting with a torch is close enough. <laughs> so we'll be doing that. More Kirby. Yes, yes, Amaya. Round pink ball, but orange and blue, not clickbait. Not a clickbait. Um, I'm more focusing on atmosphere, but yeah, <laughs> We're going to be working with some some orange and blue today. Yeah, I remember my, my pre-production professor, when he was talking about color, he was like, he was like, I promise you, if you ever get like a job in a, as a concept artist for a video game, and they ask you to do like a whole like background use orange and blue it'll work every single time and i'm like really and he's like yeah it's it's their favorite <laughs> for some reason it's their favorite and i was like oh okay so now every single time i think of him whenever i think of orange and blue so i'm gonna make sure that i have enough emphasis on the torch kind of thing happening here right where is he, though? Maybe we'll have him in, like, a cave. Should I have him in a cave, or should I have him in a forest? I'm not certain. Because, like, and then... Mm, mm, I could have him in a cave, and then I could kind of focus on the blues of the cave wall. But I'm bad at drawing rock. <laughs> I'm bad at rocks! That's my only... <laughs> That's my only, um... Eh. What do y'all think? Should I have him in a forest, or should I have him in a cave? I don't know. Because I'm like, I don't know what I want to do with um, where he is. Like, I know what I want to do for the lighting, I just don't know about the setting. Cave? You're thinking caves, Anthea? Because I'm just bad at drawing rocks, so I'm scared. <laughs> ah! Challenges. A misty forest. Mm. Mist is hard to do. <laughs> Mist is very hard to do. That might lower the contrast, too, because if you have more... Hi, Nightcrasher! Welcome in! Hmm. I may stick with a cave. I may go with a cave, yeah. Because then we can have some kind of empty... It can be kind of empty around him. We'll play with that size. We'll make everything... We'll play with the space. We'll make everything kind of empty. You're thinking cave, too? Warrior Kirby. <laughs> Yo, cave. Now everybody's thinking of a cave. Alright, we'll do a cave. You're going to have to be more specific when you say Warrior Kirby, because I don't remember that copy ability. <laughs> I don't think there is that ability, copy ability. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of Kirby copy abilities. Because you could have... I could play with like the, the negative space in the foreground here with a cave. Okay. Now I'm feeling cave a little bit more. Kirby burning down a forest or cave with a monster. I mean, I've already gotten this. I was kind of thinking that I could play with the space, make it feel a lot more lonely. To really make him like a smaller subject and everything around him is very, very open. I can't draw rocks either. They cannot match how randomly... F I cannot match how randomly formed they can be. Right? It's so hard. It's like they have hard edges, but it's like... It's so strange. Okay. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to very much like... Well, Kirby's basically the Zelda Kirby. Oh, Sword Kirby! Oh, well, Sword Kirby's a little bit different, because then, like, that's a different copy ability. Personally, whenever I played Kirby games, my favorite was always, um, 
Wayne Kirby, just because, like, Wayne Kirby could fly, and it was faster than his, like, normal, like, just kind of blow himself up and float around. But Wayne Kirby, I was like, yes, I can move faster. Let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> it's so much faster. Sword was nice, though, because Sword had a lot of good attacks. Wing was kind of, like, it wasn't very high when it came to, like, attacks. Like, it wasn't very high-powered, but, like, man, could I move fast? That was my favorite thing. Put a big demonic monster right behind him. Maybe. I was kind of half thinking about that. Demons don't scare Kirby. Nothing scares Kirby. That's, like, that's the thing, though, right? It's, like, every, every Kirby game, Kirby fights, like, God or something, right? It's so crazy. It's, like, every single Kirby game is like that, you know? I feel like Kirby's just so tired at this point. <laughs> but at the same time, I don't think he cares. <laughs> he just wants to eat his food in peace, dude. Actually, it it's his own fault with Epic Yarn. You know, he ate the tomato on top of the metamato on, um, Yin Yarn's cloak. That was his own fault. That's that's not. <laughs> In Superstar Ultra, he got like, it was it Superstar? I guess it was Superstar that the the original happened when like Marks tricked him to go and like fight the Sun God or something for him so that he could like destroy the universe and that you have to fight Marks. That fight was hard when I was a kid. That fight was hard. <laughs> I remember that. It was so hard. I don't play Kirby often because I prioritize my favorite games and that I don't have any money left. You bet the most overpowered transformation is my favorite in every game. That's that's fair. So I'm assuming you'd like Crash Kirby. It only lasts like once, but it it like insta kills everything on screen. <laughs> if it's within the boundaries of the screen, it's like insta kill. It's same with Mike Kirby, but it lasts like three times. But it isn't an insta kill for everything. It's an insta kill for most things. Are you drawing with a mouse? No, I am using a Cintiq Pro 13. A Cintiq 13 HD. Those little eyes have already seen everything. Yes, they have. He was the last survivor in Smash. <laughs> Smash Ultimate. Is it me or games these days? Ain't that challenging compared to games in the 1990s? It depends on the audience that you're looking for. Some games are purposefully made to be really, really challenging. And others, kind of like Nintendo's or whatever, are, you know, their audience changes, so then they have to change too. Sometimes the challenge was just that the controls sucked. I think that's what some games were. It's like, oh, these controls are terrible, and then they got better, and it's like, oh, there's not enough challenge. It's like, just calm down, dude. Just like, <laughs> Epic Yarn was, I think, the only Kirby game I had. I wish I had more, though. It was great. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Genshin Impact? I do not play Genshin. I think it's also for accessibility reasons. Like, some, if they're, like, too hard, then some people can't really, you know, play them. So I think it is also for accessibility reasons, which I, like, I agree with. Some people find it harder to understand certain instructions and whatever. All right, so before I do any kind of lighting, flats are very important, right? You fill in your flats first and then you can get to the lighting. That's what's lovely about digital is you can do that. <laughs> oh, I didn't, I didn't change that. Pressure by opacity, or size by pressure, that's right. I think I did a drawing class with you. Did you? Tell me the lesson we did. I don't really care about how challenging a game is because I will most likely suck at it anyway because I say I'm a good gamer. That doesn't mean I'm good. Oh, me. I, I rarely care about difficulty level or anything like that. I'm a very big story person. If you can tell me a good story or if you can tell me... Like, I'm very picky with my stories, but if you can tell me a good story or if you can give me really great characters, I will probably be into it very quickly. You can kind of tell with, like, Kirby, most Nintendo games are the exception. <laughs> um, but you, you can kind of tell with, like, my list of games that I really, really enjoyed. I really liked Omori. I really liked Undertale. Um, what else? 
the beginner's guide. I really like God of War 4. Mother, the entire Mother series. The entire Mother franchise, right? Mother 3 is my favorite one out of all three. You know, it's very easy to get me to... It's very easy to tell which games I'll really like, but... Yeah. Okay. And let's just make this whole background, like... Ka-chow. Ka-chow. Alright. I'll merge this afterwards, because... That's what we need to do. Omori is the first horror game I ever enjoyed playing. Hello, Hannah. Welcome in. Omori, I think, is like a psycho. It's a psychological horror. Um, it was a little spooky, but it wasn't super spooky. I love horror. I'm a very big horror person. So like, but a lot of like AAA horror is kind of boring. It's I I like very few AAA horror. My favorite horror game is Faith. Faith is one of my favorite games, just in general as well. Um, by Airdorf. It's an indie really really good it's styled in the same way that an atari game would be styled or a commodore game just like a very it's like styled like a very very old game it's very very good really spooky though it's spooky in it for a different reason though jesse you have such good taste in games thank you <laughs> it's a couple of classes a week my name is nina mm. Mm. I'm bad at games, me too. Bad at remembering, me too. Nina. Perhaps. Perhaps. Perhaps, perhaps. I think I remember that name. I had a couple Ninas. But if you did have a class with me... Hey. <laughs> hello, hello. I do teach classes, by the way. Um, We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But, yeah. Alright, now it's time to All right, clip that real quick. Give him the old dark color treatment. We'll clip that again. Oops, clip that again. Turn on to hard light. Erase that from here. Whoopsies, erase that from here. It was just the one week, one week. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. All right. I'm bad at games, yeah. Um, That's all good. Yeah. Trying to get into horror because I've hated horror my entire life. I was exactly the same when I was a kid. I hated horror for a really long period of my life. Um, Now I love horror. I used, I used to hate it, right? It was a really big... I hated Halloween, guys. That's how much I hated horror. <laughs> I'm going to be using this orange to kind of brighten this whole thing up. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, I hated Halloween. I hated everything to do with horror. It, it ruined me constantly. It was like the worst. I just hated it all, you know. Now that I've gotten older, I, I love horror. I love everything about it. Um, it was horror games that made me love horror. Most notably, like, uh, some of my first games were like, um, or some of my first, like, uh, horror videos, you know, or like, PewDiePie videos, you know, kind of like the classic kind of horror. <laughs> um, the older kind of videos that he did, right? Um, he doesn't do horror anymore, but... Or he doesn't do it often. If he does, then he, like, makes fun of it. Mercifully. Mercilessly. <laughs> um, but, yeah, no, it was... That was my first introduction to horror games. And then I read... Started reading a lot of horror. And I love horror literature. Um... But yeah. Hi, hello, hello, Angie. Welcome in. Uh, I hated horror most of my life, but in the past couple of years, I'm a bit obsessed now. Yummy. Yeah, <laughs> me. <laughs> Playing Genshin Impact right now. Ah, I have a few online friends who really love Genshin. I used to think horror was silly as a whole thing, but it turns out the only, only the movies really silly. Yeah. Horror movies are so weird. Like, they're so weird. <laughs> Like, I mean, so weird. Like, some of them are, like, kind of good, but, like, a lot of them are really weird. I'm gonna have to fix this, too, once I get a little bit more with it. And we'll do a little bit of this as well. 
don't worry, I'm gonna I'm gonna merge all this, so all these layers that you see before you are going to disappear soon enough, but I just need this for now. Oops, no, this should be hard white. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. I don't really say much that I, I watch PewDiePie because I know that a lot of some people hate him, but I'm like, dude, I, I haven't stopped watching him since I was like 14. Like, I, I mean that. <laughs> Horror just needs a good story, too. Very true. Now I really like horror books and games. Yeah, same. I used to think horror was, yeah. it The horror horror movies, I think the weirdest one, the worst one I've ever watched, were one of the worst ones. I think it was, oh my god. It was with Kevin Bacon. I don't remember what the movie was called, but it was about this house. It had such a cool concept, and then they ruined it. It was like, it was such a cool concept, and then everything was just like, they ruined it, and I got so mad. I was like, are you kidding me? This could have been so cool, but you decided to make it like this. Uh, so this is M. This is HL. This is also HL. Excellent. Now we can work with this. Hi, what I miss? Hello! Welcome in Blue Diamond. Um, we're doing the final piece for the day. We did our whole lesson already about contrasts. We were talking about contrasts for a while. Um, but right now we're just finishing up the final piece for the day. So I'm going to be contrasting with color. So that's I'm going to be using a lot of oranges and blues. I'm going to actually have to fix around here. I'm going to need some bounce light. That's all good. I like doing bounce light. Here's a strategy for you. If you don't really like digital painting, I digitally paint very much like a traditional artist um, where I have like one layer and I kind of blend everything together. Um, a strategy is to start with the background and then go into the foreground. Start with the background and then go onto the elements in front of it. It's so hard to control this thing. It's like, I wish I had my square, you know? <laughs> Five Nights at Freddy line story is so big. I That's why I'm like, I'm a very much like, I like with horror, the thing with horror is that horror needs simplicity. And, like, if you have something... Five Nights at Freddy's lore is very, very large. And, like, at this point, it doesn't feel like horror anymore. It just kind of feels like a very long adventure story. You know? Watch Resident Evil 8. Let's face it, the only thing that made me uncomfortable is the imaginary pain in my left hand and puppets. Oh, yeah. I love Resident Evil 8, though. <laughs> I just love the character designs. They're so cool. Puppet House is definitely the scariest. Yes. Um, uh, Madame... Ben, but starts with the B. Benvenido, I think that's what it is. Not certain. I keep forgetting. Um, but I love that. I love that section with the baby. So good. So good. I just love the character design so much. It's like, it's so cool. <laughs> is it okay to have the background with the character together? Yeah, sure. Dude, I've merged everything. I'm working on one layer. Like it's. <laughs> It depends on what you're working on. Like, I would never do this with a different piece, but if I'm painting, I'm just going to keep everything in one layer. Like, I'm not... I'm not too picky when it comes to that. Don't judge Jesse's ways. Yeah, no, I'm the weird one. Don't worry. I do, <laughs> I do it this way because I'm, uh... I'm lazy. Um, if it depends on what I'm working on, like if I have a, it depends on how I work on stuff, I guess, you know, on some of my backgrounds, I have like a crazy amount of layers and I hate it, but you know, sometimes it's needed. Um, but other backgrounds, oh, like an actual sketchbook. Yeah. One layer is so powerful. Yeah, never. Beneviento. That's it. Yeah. It's Italian. I keep mixing it up with, um. French. <laughs> Beneviento, yeah. House Beneviento. Oh, digital traditional artist, yeah. I, I try to be... I haven't worked traditionally in so long. I painted something the other day, but like I... Like traditionally, but like I, I'm so rusty. I really need to get back into it. I used to be so versatile, and now I'm like, uh... 
fucked. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, House Beneviento was pretty good. I really liked um, the section with... Uh, obviously, I liked um, House Dimitrescu. And then I really liked... Um, I wasn't a huge fan of Moreau. But I really liked um, Heisenberg's like place. Just because Heisenberg is a cool character. I liked him a lot. <laughs> Need four layer to sketch a face. Never! Never. <laughs> if I take a piece really seriously, then there's a few sketch layers, but like I would never. That's too many layers. Yes, I'm a big fan of House Dimitrescu. If you're wondering, I didn't play it myself, but I watched Jacksepticeye play it. Um, that's who I got <laughs> my uh, my Resident Evil 8 knowledge from. Um, but yes, that was it's a good game. <laughs> it's like I just love the characters; they all look so cool. That's what got me hooked. It was just the way that the characters looked. Now I'm kind of getting hooked back onto Subnautica because Below Zero was released and like I I love aliens. <laughs> I love alien designs and if you can make alien designs look really cool then I'm all in. And every single Subnautica alien design looks so good and I'm like, dude, I am so into this. Like it was so good. Hello, fancy dinosaur, welcome in. No worries, you don't need to worry about being late. I don't play games that much, I just watch gameplay. Yeah, I watch more gameplay than I do. I watch it from Jack too. It was so funny, yeah. Heisenberg's voice actor also plays a cool character in Detroit Become Human, so I already know about him. Oh, which one? I don't know that. I didn't know that. Have you seen the RE8 mod where every time you look at, at Lady Dimitrescu, her hat gets bigger? I have not seen that one, but now I have to. <laughs> you scared me for a second when you said mod. I go, <laughs> like, can I talk about the mods on stream? Uh, but no, I haven't seen that one. Now I have to, so thank you for notifying me. Oh, what time is it? Oh, it's 5.02. Okay. It is 5.02. So it's top of the hour, so you know what time it is. That means that we're going to do our mini little plugs, because if you're kind of new to the studio, then you probably don't know much about us. So if you don't know too much about our little studio here, Wing Canvas, then you probably don't know that we're not only a YouTube channel, we're also an art school. Whoops. We're also an art school. So if you would like to check out any of the class offerings that we do, I am one of the instructors. Um, Yuri, who pops back in and out, is also one of the instructors. Um, and you should check out our classes. Our, our website is getting a kind of makeover. And we're also starting summer camps. So if you would like to kind of pop into summer camp, then feel free to do so and check out what we have to offer. And this piece that you see before you, this one and the lesson that I talked about, both of those will be uploaded as JPEGs to our Discord. So be sure to check out our Discord um, to download these, keep them, save them, do whatever you want with them. They're all yours. Just don't repost them and you can reference them at any point if you would like. Um, but if you would like to see my working files, because there are a lot of layers here and also all of my examples are in here. I won't be posting the examples into Discord, but I will be posting the final lesson. So if you'd like the layers with everything in here, be sure to check out our Patreon where you can get um we can get working files every other week and the other half of those weeks you get behind the scenes sneak peeks. So I will be talking a bit about what happens behind the scenes here at Wing Canvas. Um more than what I talk about on stream. <laughs> um but yeah, there are also limited spots for discounts on our classes, so be sure to check those out before they are gone. Alright, work back in. How does the summer camp work? So it is they are daily camps, daily classes over the summer. Um, they'll be lasting, I believe, from June all the way to August, if I remember correctly. Um, so I teach the teen intensives, so those classes are a little bit trickier. Um, but they'll be kind of... Um, so what do I teach? I teach... Oh my god. I teach comic art, character design, figure drawing, and illustration. So we'll be working... I'll be teaching those for teen intensives. Um, and... You know, they're kind of focused on very specific things, specific lessons. I'll have like a lesson plan and you'll be focusing on um, 
very intense kind of learning in terms of art with whatever specific thing that you choose. Um, there are the kids camps as well, which are a little bit simpler. You know, there's cartooning camp, there's beginner drawing camp, stuff like that. Um, and those are more for the youngins. Again, there are daily classes, but each week will have a different theme. Um, same with the teen intensives, but the teen intensives will be more like every week will be just a smidge different. Um, but yeah, so check out the summer camps. I love teaching the summer camps, so be sure to check those out for some kind of intensive learning if you're coming for the teen camps. And if you're not coming for the kids camps, there will be other instructors that will teach those. Jesse carrying the whole school. I am not. <laughs> I am one of very. I am one of the very many instructors that we have. Um, so I I teach very few of the actual classes. I have a few. Um, currently, I teach three. So I teach mentorship and two cartooning and animes. Um, but yeah, I love teaching. Teaching is one of my favorite parts of working at the studio. So I love the teaching and I love the live streaming. Those are two of my favorite things. <laughs> I love the interaction portion. I'm interested. Yeah, you can check out more about the summer camp if you want to go onto the website, summer camp registrations. I'm not sure if they're open yet, um, but keep it in mind. I'll announce it for sure if they are open um, or when they're open. Actually, Amaya, you're here right now if you want to kind of check for us, <laughs> see if they're open or not. Um, but... Yeah, summer camp is so fun. It's super, super fun. Um, I'm excited to teach teen intensives um, because usually I teach the kitty camps, so it's going to be kind of fun to teach the, the intensives this time, um, which are a little bit different. Should I use, I need to use some blue bounce light because it's feeling a little bit flat in some areas, and I think it needs it. You basically run the social media. I get why I wouldn't teach that much as an instructor. I don't run the social media. I'm actually not part of the social media team. Um, I'm part of the content creation team. Um, social media is run mostly by other individuals, as in like our Instagram is run by other people. Our YouTube is usually run by other people. Um, but I'm kind of just the face of a lot of it. So you kind of see me a lot just because like, I'm like the, think of like a movie. I'm kind of the actor and everyone else is doing everything behind the scenes. <laughs> I'm kind of pulling from Nature because I'm realizing she's a really great artist. Um, I'm pulling from her techniques, I'm realizing now. Interesting. I didn't think I had it in the back of my brain, but here we are. Oh, you're in Columbia. Yep, it's virtual. All virtual. Hello, sorry I'm late. You're not too late. Hello, Gabriel. Welcome in. We're just doing the final illustrations. We're finishing up just a little bit now. And even if you are late, you know, you can just kind of watch the live stream replay if you really want to see what we did. We went over contrast, and this whole thing will be summarized in a little video, which I will edit for later. Because the principles of design are being live streamed as well as edited later on. I should have done this for lighting. What's wrong with me? I should have done this. <laughs> Yeah. See, you notice how linear I am with illustration? It's just, like, how I do it. I'm like, <laughs> I know a lot of people like to go back and forth with their stuff, and I'm like, nah, I just do it all kind of in one go. <laughs> oh my god. There we go. Yeah, I'm kind of pulling from Matrix. I didn't realize I had her kind of like her techniques down in my head. <laughs> She's he's so cute. Yes, he is. Is there kind of an art level that you need for the camp? Because maybe I can convince my parents to let me attend that. Not really. Um, I try to teach with like most levels in mind. Um, like I the classes that I teach with are fairly advanced. Um, and the techniques are fairly advanced, but. I think anyone can learn them, just as long as they have, like, the, you know, the, <laughs> the kind of willpower to learn it, you know?
So I'm very much a fan of like, do your best. I think that's what I tell like all of my students all the time. <laughs> I'm like, don't worry. I'm not expecting perfection. Just do your best, you know? <laughs> I can only ever ask for your your best, but there are like they we do kind of have like um like on our website we have like what level or like how quote unquote tricky some classes are supposed to be or how tricky some camps are kind of expected to be or what grade level you're kind of expected. So again, for teen intensives, it's meant for like teenagers at the very minimum. Um, Right, and they're meant to be kind of intense, right? So they're meant to be a little bit more, a little more challenging, a little bit more tricky um, compared to regular classes. Um, which means I'm gonna try and put you through the ringer. <laughs> That's what that means. Um, don't worry, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not harsh. Um, but yeah, you don't really have like a a needed needed thing, but some classes are trickier than others, so. You kind of got to judge for yourself sometimes. Oh, oh my god. There's this one game. Um, I always want to bring it up in stream, and I just keep forgetting. It's really, really good. It's super short. It's like an hour long. It's a very... It's a fairly easy puzzle game. You're kind of just meant to look at it more so. Oh my god. I think it's called, like, Tiny Eye or something. I'm starting art at 15. I just track three from the age level on the site. On the site. That's all good. I wouldn't be at age 15 level. That's all right. Listen, man. It's more so like a, a like the what age you might need to be to be able to comprehend kind of what we talk about. Right. My art mentorship has people literally of all ages. I, I mean literally of all ages. I have people who are past twenty and then I have people who are not even past thirteen. So it's like all different levels. So it's a little bit hard to teach that range, but you know, so long as you kind of encapsulate it, it, it it's all right. Um, but yeah, don't worry. It's, it's all just kind of about comprehension sometimes. Tricky but fun, so it all balances out. Yeah. <laughs> I try to make my stuff fun. And like, if you're struggling, then I try to make it a little bit easier, you know. Again, I never expect perfection. Never, never. I expect you to be learning, and that's why you're here, right? Fire. I like stylized fire. I can never do real fire. <laughs> My fire always looks like this. <laughs> it's like very like kind of geometric and a little bit more fun. I like it this way to be fair. Hello Gabriel, welcome in. Um, so far we've just been learning about contrast. I'm kind of uh, working with this so far. So all I've been doing is kind of blending this bad boy in. Um, we learned a bit about contrast, the principle of design earlier. So now I'm kind of doing contrast with color so far, but I'm glad you can make it regardless. For all y'all who are like a little bit older watching this stream, I had to force myself to learn how to merge with the highway yesterday. It was so scary. Like I'm not, <laughs> It was easy once I did it, but like I didn't. <laughs> I've never done it on my own before, and I was like, yo. <laughs> so, like, I was... <laughs> For those who are a little bit younger, if you don't know what merging with the highway is, um, it's it's a driving thing. So, like, when you're driving and you have to merge with the highway, um, it means you have to kind of go onto the highway and merge with the traffic that's on there. <sighs> I realized I, I wanted to expand this, and I already painted curve. Man, this is why working with layers is important, guys, and I don't do that. Um. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I had to teach myself how to merge with the highway, and it was like, it was so scary. Like, I've never, <laughs> I've never done it on my own, and I had to like hype myself up so much to like 
merge with the like to merge the highway. Yeah. So it, it, for those who are younger, if you don't know what merging with the highway is, like if you think of like if you've never driven with like your parents or guardian or whatever, and like you know they had to go on the highway and they have to take that kind of loop de loop to go onto the highway and then merge with it. So you'll notice how like they have to speed up while they're going on the loop de loop thing, and then they merge with the highway. Scary. <laughs> It's so scary. <laughs> because it's like you'll be going like 40 and then suddenly you'll be going 100 so you can get there. I always get so nervous when my dad merged with the highway. I think someone will be dumb and not stop for us. Yeah, it's it's a thing. Like my driving instructor, when I used to go to driving school, they were like, he was like, trust me, people will always part. Like if they don't, then like they're dumb. And I was like, oh, okay. Right. Thankfully, I was I kind of went on a slightly emptier day. So like it wasn't so bad, but like I was I was so scared. And like and then afterwards on my way back, it was during rush hour. And I was like, hmm, great, fantastic. So I guess that's what I have to deal with. <laughs> yeah, this kind of shade, this kind of blending is hard with this brush. I think it's going to be close to time, almost time when I have to actually make a Medibang account so I can, I can download brushes. <laughs> We're getting to that point, y'all. <laughs> like the defaults work, but man, I miss having like a rectangular brush to blend stuff in with, you know, that handles a little bit differently than this. Uh, rush hours is so scary. <laughs> rush hours in Toronto. Toronto? Yeah, no. Not happening. You know what I mean? You gotta ca caught up in it and, you know. I haven't seen that in a while. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Hey yo, hello Jay, welcome in. Hey yo, hey yo. We're talking about rush hour. <laughs> I'm scared when there's a crazy person on the highway, like someone with bad temperament screams to everyone and always wants to be in front of you. Yeah. Oh my god. Those are always so scary. I was driving on, like, a regular road the other day, and there was a BMW who kept, like, tailgating me. So scary. I was like, can you not? Like, it's... <laughs> I'm already, like, kind of, like, half-speeding, and the only reason is because you're behind me and trying to, like... Ugh. So scary. Wild J has appeared! I hate them. Yeah, it's so scary. Like, I'm like, please, please. <laughs> please. Alright, I'm gonna pull an epic move because I realize I need to like... He needs to move up a little bit. Now what I can do is this. Let's go and then I can just... Let's go! That's called strategy. My dad is an angry driver. I always get terrified that he gets so angry and he crashes the car because he'll speed up like crazy when mad. Yeah, my dad does that sometimes. Like, he, he's controlled, but like, man. <laughs> sometimes more experienced drivers, drivers will get angrier faster. It's weird. I realize that I'm only nervous if I'm just by myself. If I'm with other people, then I'm, I'm quite chill when I drive. Maybe a little too chill, but <laughs> don't worry. Yeah, I should have done the whole background atmosphere first, shouldn't I? Instead of just focusing on Kirby first. There is my first mistake. It's my own fault. It's okay. Whatever. <laughs> I'll live with it. 
I have a confusion with Canada TVH. There's a lot of nice people. Most of the paranormal stories I hear are from there. People are nice, but ghosts aren't. Yeah. I haven't heard a lot of Canadian paranormal stories. The most paranormal thing about everything that I've heard is like the moose that kind of pop out in the middle of the night, you know? Maybe it's just a dad thing. Your dad too, Gabriel. Maybe it's just a dad thing. I don't know. Like, <laughs> Actually, my, my cousin's uncle is quite chill. My cousin's from Jamaica. They're quite chill. Prepare to face any poltergeist. Plan to move to Canada. Nothing will stop me. Yeah, let's go. Come to Canada. <laughs> Ghost moose. Yeah. Honestly, that's kind of plausible. Considering. You know, all things considered. <laughs> right? It was a bad decision to draw Kirby first. Oh well, I got kind of caught up on, <laughs> on rendering him. It's okay, I can kind of just avoid this very lightly. <laughs> no worries, Jesse. This is digital art. There's magical ways to fix your mistakes. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I am a... I am a stickler for using very little layers, and um, it's my own fault this time. So, <laughs> it's like, could I lasso him out, or like select tool him out, and like figure it out that way? Yes, but do I want to? Not really. Because <laughs> not only am I a digital artist, I am the lazy artist. <laughs> the idea you shouldn't run away if you see a ghost. You should take. You should take. You should take a picture of it, talk to it, or just touch it. You ever tried touching a ghost? I don't know if that, that's how it works. I don't, I don't know if you can do that. Like, <laughs> just... I don't think that's something you can do. If they're incorporeal, that's what that's basically in the name, right? It's like, they're incorporeal. You can't touch them, you know? Rocks. I am bad at rocks. And this is why we are not focusing on the rocks today. shouldn't be scared if it kills you. There's nothing more epic than dying because of a ghost. I understand. <laughs> Dang, you're you're ready to go out in like a blazing glory. I respect that. Like please don't, but like, you know. <laughs> What if we're all ghosts? Mm. That's big brain. What if we're all actually just entities? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you actually convinced me. Yeah, let's go. What if ghosts are entities out of another dimension, like a fourth dimension? Some people speculate that. I'd have a tea party with the local aunties from 1659 before I get bothered by some weird supernatural phenomenon. I understand. I want to ask it questions. You think a ghost will respond if it, I just ask it, like, dude, what's it look like right now, man? Do you think it, if any of you played Phasmophobia, do you think it looks the same? Like, you know when you die in Phasmophobia and it's like, you know, <laughs> you're in like some weird, like, kind of dimension where, like, nobody can see you, but you can kind of, like, hear them and everything's kind of, like, wispy? You think it looks the same? Kind of epic. Sorry, I need to go walk my dog. I might be back. All right, thank you for joining so far. We'll be here for another half hour or so. Dude, rocks. The heck are rocks, dude? Have a nice walk. Jay, I'm dying. <laughs> Me too.
If we're the ghosts, does that mean we already died? Hmm, perhaps. What if we're all, like, you know, like in the Matrix, when it's, like, we're all a simulation? What if we are all a simulation? You know what I'm saying? Like, not to put on, like, a tinfoil hat, right? Because I know that people don't like tinfoil hatting, but, like, could you imagine? I think ghosts are glitches in reality. You see something from the past or future when you shouldn't see that. Some ghosts are. If you've ever watched, like, a ghost television, like, if you've ever watched a ghost show, right, they're like, oh, some ghosts are, like, whispers of the past or whatever. Or however, however they describe it or something like that. You know what I'm saying? I want to recreate the moment where Mark screamed while Sean and the others were outside just dying. And Sean and Wade and uh, Wade <laughs> were just like laughing. That's so that was so funny when I watched it the first time. I like watching Mark's Uno videos. Those are my favorites. With like Bob and Wade, those are so funny. Oh no, it was um oh my god, Sean was outside with Wade. That's right, and they were both just laughing at him. That was really funny. <laughs> The stream is getting deeper than I was expecting. Yeah, literally. You should join one of my classes. Oh, I'm kidding. You are part of my classes. LOL. <laughs> you are in my class. Um, sometimes I just start talking about, like, life and, like, how to... <laughs> if you've never been to one of my classes where I get a little philosophical sometimes... Or not philosophical, but sometimes I just talk about, like, art careers and how you should be as an artist. And it's like... My students are like, wow, I wasn't expecting, like, a therapy lesson. I'm like, sorry. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kind of in that mood. Um, I saw the ghost of your grandma. You followed her, but she was gone. Oh, interesting. My family says that I saw the ghost of my grandfather because, like, I, they said, like, when I was a baby, I was, like, in a kitchen, and I was just waving to, like, the corner of the room, and my parents were like, who are you waving to? And I was like, that's great. It's Gung Gung, he's over there. I'm Hakka Chinese, by the way. Um, and I was like, it's Gung Gung, he's right there. He's saying hi too, right? Nobody was there. I, my family was like, uh, <laughs> hmm. <laughs> so everyone in my family says that I saw my grandpa when I was like a baby. Now remember y'all, when you have a piece kind of like this, generally the surroundings should be fairly low details, then you can focus on the one thing that you should be looking at, whether it's bathed in light or if it's, you know, shrouded in something. Oftentimes you kind of want it to be like, the first thing you look at, these rocks don't make sense. Wouldn't mind the world being a simulation because that means it'll probably abruptly stop and the weird and uncomfortable theories of rebirth can be put to rest. <laughs> Hey man, everyone has different theories of what the world is, you know? Whatever you believe in, I'm not here to judge you. My beliefs are my own, your beliefs are your own. Okay, 528. Got about a half hour left. I still want to add more to this, but I'm like... When I zoom out, I could make this a little bit taller because it is kind of just there, you know. Could be a little bit more richer. Watching you paint is so calming. Thank you. Welcome in, 97 and randomly T. Glad you're in. A 
Oh, for all we know, we could be part of a massive Sims game. I joke with my brother that we kind of live the same way as, like, Animal Crossing characters do, right? Sometimes we'll kind of, like, just walk around the house, dance in place for a second, <laughs> walk back to do other random activities, or walk back, dance in another spot, <laughs> go back home, <laughs> do activities. <laughs> Is this Kirby Search of the Lost Knife? Oh, you're so right. My philosophy is that your life itself is a dream. When you sleep, you move to another reality. When you move to the dream world, you forget about this world. And when you come back, you forget about the dream reality. I never forget my dreams. But I like to think that all my dreams are a connected universe. Because sometimes the same settings pop up. Being in a Sims game would answer a lot of questions. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> Have to leave now, but I had fun. Bye. Bye, Hannah. Thanks so much for joining. Just, have you ever had a deja vu in a dream? I think I have. But, like, when I woke up, I was like, oh, I've never been there before. <laughs> it was never really, like, deja vu. I, but, I, like, when I wake up, I remember, like, oh, yeah, I was already there. Like, I've been there before. <clears throat> It's like some dreams happen in the same place. I've had a few dreams that were in the same underground bunker. I've had a few dreams that were in the same snowy town. I've had a few dreams that were at the same, like, seven-tiered mall. Those are always kind of funny. <laughs> Those dreams are always kind of funny. It's like a seven-tiered, like, kind of cyberpunk-looking mall. That's one that I'm always in. It's like sometimes it's really busy and sometimes it's really empty. And the ceilings are always glass. And there's always advertisements everywhere that are displayed on big LCD screens or LED screens that are just kind of floating. They're never on poles. They're always floating. I always go back to that mall. That one always ends up showing up in my dreams for some reason. Why am I randomly hungry at 11 p.m.? I swear I'll throw my organs against the wall someday. I have, like, two dream worlds. One is creepily vivid, real. The other one's just an anime. Understandable. Um, I always have super visit vivid dreams. Um, in the Discord. Join the Discord, by the way. Um, in the Discord, I we did, like, a little, like, late night kind of, like, talk. It was, like, at 12 a.m. or something. 12 a.m. Canadian. Um, or, like, EDT. And, like, I read out. It was like it took like half an hour <laughs> to read my entire dream out because it was like there was so much. It was so vivid. But yeah, I read my dream for about a half hour, but a bunch of them just watch me work, so join the join the Discord. We might do more of those. To just hang out secret streams. Join the Discord for secret streams. Link in the description. <laughs> I'm realizing about this. It does frame it nicely, but it's like, it's maybe a little bit too much. Maybe Kirby needs to be moved. Because he's a little bit... It feels a little bit off right now. This is going to be a hassle to move. Oh well. It's okay. I got a pad for time anyway. It's a little better if he's, like, fair. I already told you about my cosmic dreams. I think that when I dreamed about the Milky Way as a future, because one day we won't see many stars in the observable uniforms. <laughs> Perhaps. Deuter, you guys are super surreal and never make sense, but I go along with them anyway. Yeah. Hello, Aaron. Welcome in. Stream's almost over, actually, but hey, welcome in. Uh, about a half hour left. Aaron is one of our lovely volunteers here at the studio. 
I believe he's volunteering, if I remember correctly. But yes, welcome in. Glad you could make it. Drawing Kirby. <laughs> We're talking about dreams and ghosts. So not too different. Why you work on one layer? That's insane. Um, That summarizes it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just a little insane. Um, this is what I do every single time. Don't don't worry about it. I, uh, I do this to myself. It's just my fault. It's my fault. That's right. <laughs> Usually my vivid dreams are really uncomfortable and creepy. My last vivid dream is about some really weirdly big type of scorpion plague in my country. I live in Germany. There are no scorpions here. <laughs> I volunteer. It's been fun. I'm glad. Um, oh, man. Should I tell one of my dreams? I could. Because I have a lot of weirdly vivid ones. I've memorized them, too. I don't need to read them, but... Um, let's see. Let's think. What dream could I talk about? Because I have a lot. Um, hmm. I'm trying to reach for one. One of my favorite ones that I always used to tell when I was a kid was when my whole... As in, like, fifth grade. I mean, kid. Uh, if you don't know, fifth grade in Canada is about 12, no? Fifth grade is about 10 to 11 years old. Um, so when I was about fifth grade, I had a dream where my whole school got turned into a paintball arena. And I, I got to my school and everything was like painted in like neon purples and greens. And I was like, yo, what's, what's happening here, right? And my teacher comes up and we're like, it's like, you better suit up. And I was like, why? And she's like, we're in a paintball war. You gotta get ready. And I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> right? So she just kind of hands me like a paintball paintball gun right and I'm like oh okay and I have to like kind of get ready to like paintball with everyone right and there was like a whole paintball tournament that happened in my school it was kind of epic right the whole school got transformed into a giant jungle gym right and uh it was like I I had to there's one very vivid section where I saw my friend get like tossed out a window and it was like in slow motion and I remember seeing like all the glass particles like in like a truck like in a a Hollywood movie or whatever. <laughs> that was one section that I remember seeing very vividly. Um, and then at one point, like I was kind of sneaking around in a room. Um, and then some dude, another dude pushed me out of a window. Right. And I kind of, and instead of like the tarmac below where stuff was, I got, I was tossed into the ocean. So there was an ocean. And then uh, a Perry, the platypus showed up and, had to like fight this giant seaweed monster that popped up out of nowhere and then he won and like you know the seaweed monster was like curse you parry the platypus you know like the dr doof and Shred's voice which i'm not going to imitate and then i woke up that was that was a that was a funky one again fifth grade i don't really remember it anymore because but i used to tell it a lot um and that one was one of my favorites that i would always tell and there was another one that i had more recently i was in a mall and I was, like, running away from animatronics. I drew that one. I, I drew a piece based off of it. <laughs> I think I shared it in the... Uh, in the live stream. Because sometimes my dreams are so vivid where I can actually draw, like, stills from it. So that was a fun one. I remember waking up in a cold sweat. Because it was kind of freaky. But then I was like, whoa. Okay, now I have to draw it. And I did. Yeah, TLDR, use your dreams as inspiration, guys. If you ever, like, if you have more vivid dreams, use your dreams as inspiration. I, I'm dead serious. Like, write them down. You'll never get creativity as raw as a dream. Your subconscious knows a lot. It was weird before Perry the Platypus. I don't know. Fifth grade brain? Like, you don't know what's in there. I don't know what's in there. You know what I'm saying? That paintball dream sounds awesome. It was awesome, honestly, you know. But then I played paintball for real, and I don't like paintball anymore. <laughs> I think that telling your dreams is useless because people will never understand it. So you need to you they feel things that you can't explain and people won't understand. Yeah. It depends on what kind of dream you have. My A lot of my dreams are just ridiculous, and I just think they're ridiculous. They don't really make me feel much, but... There were some dreams that I've had that were very, very harrowing to me. And, like, I don't really tell them publicly. So it's like, I have some dreams where I'm like, whoa. <laughs> Eradicating your classmates with dope. With paint sounds dope. Yeah, it's like a real-life game of Splatoon. I guess I guess Splatoon is based off of paintball. So, I mean, that's not, <laughs> it's not the best analogy, but whatever. 
I will write a novel about dreams. Do it. Sounds fun. But yeah, write write down your dreams. Like you'll never have something as creative as your subconscious. I once created a whole set of characters based off of a dream that I had, and that was like it was so good. There was like um not the one that I talked about in the in the secret stream, but you guys know which one I'm talking about if you were there. Um but it the there was another set of characters and like I mentioned that I always have dreams in this underground bunker and it was like there were these characters. There was one girl named Zero and she had very like bright pink hair. I remember like illustrating her the next morning. I was like, dude, she's so cool. <laughs> paintball is just art with guns. I understand. Paintball hurts, dude. If you've never played paintball before I remember I went to like the summer camp back when I was in seventh-ish grade, and th we went to go paintballing. None of us had equipment or anything, and they just kind of gave us our guns, but we didn't have any padding or anything. It hurts, dude. It hurt a lot. We had to, we went up against, like, some, like, pro paintballers who had, like, all of their stuff with them, and, like, a bunch of, like, seventh graders, and we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> we instantly got, like, wrecked, dude. I was, like, cornered, and, like, I was, like, I was hit mercilessly. I had I had I had swell uh what's it called welts on my back because I was hit at like almost point blank a lot it hurt a lot not gonna lie um so I don't really want to do paintballing again um <laughs> I was talking about my more harmless vivid dreams because they're so so trippy and the face people make when they're questioning your sanity is amazing mm, yeah. I tell a lot of my closer friends my uh dreams like instantly when I wake up I'm like dude listen to this right <laughs> i like tell the dream to them and i'm like dude listen bro they kind of expect it at this point just my super vivid dreams because it's just something that i do all the time now is just tell my dreams but like yeah weird ones they take a really long time to type out though because they're very long and intense I haven't done. I haven't flipped. I should flip actually. Oop! LOL. Yeah, dreams are really trippy. It's like sometimes I'll like. I like question what I'm dreaming about and that's when I wake up. It's like if I start to question it, then it wakes me up. And I'm like, hmm. Interesting. Oh, I had one recently actually. Oh my god, I just remembered. I had one recently. Um, I always have like two different types of dreams, right? There's one where it's actually me or I'm observing other people, right? So I'm not even there. And I'm just kind of watching something happen, right? Um, this dream was kind of a mix of the two. And it started off with me like I I was part of this huge game. Um, my best friend, when I told her this, she was like, you've been watching too much Resident Evil 8. And I was like, stop it. <laughs> um, my dreams will always feel like so much short until I try typing them out. Yeah. It'd be cool that when we die, we go to the dream world forever. I, I don't think that's cool. <laughs> not with my dreams. They're not, <laughs> not with my dreams. Um, but yeah, no, I was in this huge, like, house. My dreams just boil down to just, and then I died. That's even some of my dreams. Um. Yeah, I was in this giant house, and there was this game that we had to play. I still remember the instructions. And it was like, um, we had to, so there were four quote-unquote bosses, right? There was a giant mansion. There were four quote-unquote bosses. Each of these bosses, you had to, it was like a giant game of hide-and-seek, but lethal, right? And you had to hide from these bosses. And it was like, um, it they, they all ruled four different sectors, like four bosses, like Resident Evil 8. <laughs> they all ruled different sectors of the house, right? And we had to be like, okay, um, we have to hide from them, right? Because if we they find us, they'll, they'll kill us, right? And we're like, okay. But we also had to... Um, we had a way of getting rid of them. So in each sector, there was a button, right? There was a big red button that you could press. And if you press that big red button before they found you and before they caught you then they would like die right they would they would it would 
would be the end for them. Right? So we were like, okay, so we just have to hide and survive until, you know... Uh, they leave for long enough enough for us to get the buttons. So it's kind of like a, a mix of like hide and seek and um, what time is it, Mr. Wolf? Right? If you've ever played that game as like a kid or you kind of take a couple stack steps or like red light, green light. Very similar. Right? So then like, I, so the, the whole dream, most of the dream was me like, you know, kind of running and hiding and trying to get to this red button. At one point we, we had boiled down to the final boss. Right, the final dude. He was in a kitchen. It was either in a kitchen or a living room. It was like it always kind of shifted back and forth, right, for some reason. And the the dude, right, he was like he's kind of walking around. He kind of looked like if you if you know anything about R E eight, like he kind of looked like uh, the Duke. Right. <laughs> so that's how I know that I've been a little bit too into R E eight. But um he's kind of stomping around, right? And we had to hide and at one point he was coming into the room that myself and some friends were in. I was like, okay, okay, we got we gotta hide, right? And I found this like uh under like this bedside table or this lamp shade table and I fit inside of it. And it was like I was like, Oh, I can hide in here, I can like escape, right? So I hid in there and it was like and I heard him like kind of pass by. It was it was freaky. It was kind of it was kind of scary. Um but we got to the red button and he was like I was like, Oh yes. Um if I could stay in my anime dream world, it'd be fine. My vivid world, no thanks. I'd be constantly uncomfortable, understandable. You know, none of my none of my dream worlds are good. None of them. <laughs> They're all very strange and vivid, but not. It's like very like uncanny valley, but with places, right? It's very liminal. I don't like it. Um. This whole conversation reminded me of Shark Boy and Lava Girl. Please. <laughs> um. But yeah, and then like. There was a point where I kind of woke up partially, and then I fell back asleep, right? And sometimes when I, that happens, it'll be like time has passed within the dream as well. So it's like if if it, it, the time that passes is always different depending on like what where what's happening in the dream, whatever. Um, but in this case, it was like as if like five years had passed, right? So it was like five years since this huge game had happened, right? And now I'm um, I'm no longer me. I'm in some. I'm just kind of spectating, right? It's as if I'm watching a movie. And there's this group of scientists, right? And they're in this lab, and they're all like researching about the game, right? Because it, it was a whole like thing, according to my dream, right? It was a whole like uh, news report, right? And children had been abducted and they'd been taken to this giant house, right? Because that kind of implied then that like the, the hide and seek wasn't, even though we'd won, that wasn't the final game and we were kind of kept there to keep playing the games that they had for us or something, right? It was very strange. And there were these scientists and they were kind of researching how that house worked because that kind of implied that it wasn't real, right? It was kind of like a supernatural thing. Um, and at one point, the site like they're still bringing people back from the house, right? Because apparently the games were still going on. It was just that like now all the kids are older and they're like coming back slowly, right? And there was at one point the one scientist, the scientist brought back a new batch of like the the kids who are now adults, right? And one of them uh, was an old friend of one of the scientists, and he like he saw him and he was like like in like. Uh, like, you know, kind of spectating it, but it's, like, I can still kind of understand how they're feeling. And he kind of, he kind of had, like, this huge wash of guilt over him because he realized that, because one of the scientists also escaped from the house, right? And he realized that he left his friend there. And the second that he saw him, he was reminded of that. And it was, like, the, the rest of my dream was just kind of, like, them recuperating and kind of, like, the, the scientist feeling, like, like, intense, like, survivor's guilt and the other guy who was found was like no no don't worry it was like we were kids you didn't have to don't like you had to survive and he's like yeah but like I, I left you there right it was like a whole kind of thing it was like watching a movie like all of my dreams always end like that it's like I'm watching a movie and it was like it was so like it was really cool <laughs> just kind of watching like um like you know them kind of like catch up and like the whole the whole nine yards but yeah, my dreams always end up like that for some reason. It's like it starts off like kind of strange and then it ends off with like something a little more that I can take away. Which is like, it's pretty cool. But yeah, I still think about that one sometimes.
Like, I, I texted it to my best friend. And I was like, dude, listen. You're going to have to listen to this, dude. <laughs> like, you got, like, 20 minutes or so. Listen to this, dude. <laughs> TLDR, write down your dreams. It's worth it. I promise. Okay. I wanted a little bit more blue on the end here. Where is this bounce light coming from? I don't know. I just kind of wanted to give it a little bit more... A bit more, <laughs> I suppose. All right, we got about 10 minutes left. I'm almost done here. I kind of want to, I realize I should probably put a little bit of light around this. Have I ever had sleep paralysis? I have, I used to get sleep paralysis a lot more often. Um, I don't get it as often anymore, but yeah, I've had sleep paralysis quite a few times. After one hour of watching this on my mom's phone, I fixed my Wi Fi. There you go, let's go. Um, but yeah, my sleep paralysis is a little different compared to what I've heard other people experience. So instead of me, like, seeing stuff, I, like, feel stuff and I hear stuff, right? So some, um, and, like, it feels like my whole body has, like, it's like when your foot falls asleep, so, but it feels like that throughout my whole body. And if I try to move, then it, like, it's, like, white noise intensifies. It's kind of interesting. Um, I don't find it scary anymore. I just kind of find it inconvenient. Because <laughs> I'll always be aware when it happens. And I'm like, ugh. Oh, and I'm just like, man. <laughs> so I kind of just have to sit it through. Or, like, um, I knew that snapping out of it just meant that I had to, like, shake my head a little bit hard. Um, the worst thing that ever happened to me was, like, I heard a woman whisper in my ear. Um, other things that have happened to me, I felt somebody sitting on my chest. I felt people tugging at my hair. I felt people playing with my toes. So it's always, I always feel things. I never see them. Because my eyes are always closed. I never open them because I don't want to. Um, or I can't. I don't know. But yeah, I've had sleep paralysis. Can laziness be considered sleep paralysis? I don't think so, but like, I, I vibe with that. Once I was in my uh, bedroom and I looked at a corner, there was a woman on the dark. She jumped over me very, very quickly. Oh. I was going to say in MK11, when you open chest, they gave you concept art, and the concept art shows a lot of high contrast. Cool. Funky. I'm glad I never got to sleep paralysis in my life, but I don't want that to happen to me. Yeah. It, it's not it's not a fun experience. It's very, like... Yeah. <laughs> I find it annoying. Some people, like, hate it because it's scary. I'm just, like, I'm, like, I'm just tired of it. I haven't had it in a really long time. Watch me get it tonight, because I talked about it. Um, But, yeah. I used to, during high school, I'd get it pretty often. But yeah, no, when I, when I had sleep paralysis, I never saw anything. It was always me hearing stuff. What am I using to do this? So this program is Medibang Paint Pro. And the tablet that I'm using is a Cintiq Pro 13 HD. Or Cintiq 13 HD, not the Pro. Um, which I've had for years. But yeah, so I'm using an art tablet and Medibang, which is a free software. So if you'd like to download it, all yours. Um, but most of the time, my preferred software is Photoshop. Though I also use Clip Studio Paint. Sometimes. Do I know dross? I do not. Alright, we're almost done. It's about seven minutes left. I'm just kind of doing final touches at this point. I'm trying to make it feel a little bit less harsh with my edges with the fire. Because it isn't energy. It shouldn't feel quite so solid, you know? That's how I feel about it anyway. I'm constantly checking when I zoom in and out. 
Which tablet? A Cintiq 13 HD. It's a Wacom. Would I recommend Procreate? Procreate is a lovely program. Um, one of my close friends uses it on his iPad. Um, it is a lovely program. I've heard that when people get iPads, though, they end up preferring Clip Studio because it feels a little bit more like traditional medium. Um, so it feels a little bit nicer when people work with it and the textures are a little bit nicer. But Procreate is still a lovely program. I have a lot of students that use Procreate and like their work is gorgeous. So, you know, I'll always say it's not necessarily about the program. It's about the artist behind it. Right. Any artist, a good artist can make any program work, right? <laughs> but you will never catch me working with uh, Krita. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'll, if I have to, I'll work in Krita. But I'm, I'm just like not a huge fan of Krita. But like, if you, if you like using Krita, that's all good. An artist does not amount to whatever program they use. Hi, hello, Naokushi. Welcome in. You have Fire Alpaca. That's okay. This is Mighty Bang. It's just as free as Fire Alpaca. They're very, very similar. It's Fire Alpaca and Mighty Bang. From what I've heard, anyway. I have never used Fire Alpaca. I think I've played around with it just to see how it goes. Like, a really long time ago. I mean, like, 2018 a long time ago. <laughs> I use Procreate. It's so simple. I'm terrified of transitioning to Clip. A Clip and Photoshop are very bad at like being user friendly for beginners. Beginner user friendly. I'm so used to like the so like heavy, intense kind of UIs that Photoshop and Clip I snapped onto easily. Or like Photoshop was my very first program because I used a 100% definitely legal version when I was younger. Um and. I got used to the very heavy, kind of intense sort of thing. So when I, I I started to use Clip, I found Clip very easy to learn. But I know a lot of people don't think that that's very easy to learn. <laughs> Krita is very, very slow. It's true. Yeah, Krita is a very... I, what I've heard from Krita users is that all Krita users hate Photoshop and all Photoshop users hate Krita. <laughs> it's like back and forth because they're both very, very different. And Krita uses very, very kind of proprietary... Um, shortcuts and whatever. So people have a tough time transitioning from credit to other things um, because of how proprietary it is. Oh, you guys want to see something fun? So if I turn this back on, look at that. The difference. Kirby moved too. <laughs> it's kind of fun to see how it changed. If you turn it on and off, check back with your layers. I mean, layer, but still. It's kind of fun to see the back and forth. Um, but yeah, people always, uh, I've heard that like it's kind of hard for Krita users to transition between programs because Krita is very, very proprietary. <sighs> but Krita is just as free as Medibang is, you know? So you can't complain when it's free, <laughs> you know? Photoshop and Clip are not free, neither is Procreate, but they're all very, very nice programs. Like, I'm part of the minority for digital illustrators who prefer Photoshop, but, um, you know, it's all up to, it's all up to preference. Transformation, yeah. I like to look back and forth between them. Alright, now it's all just kind of final touches. So there's a bit of edge lighting around these rocks. What has Kirby found? We don't know. I kind of wanted to do some little rocks that would have some like shadows on them, but now I'm like, I don't know if I want to do that. Because I'm like, because I could add some like rocks that are kind of here. Kirby is learning in Dimitrescu's dungeon. Dude, Dimitrescu is done if Kirby's in there. What copy ability do you think he'd get? 
by eating the the daughters because you you face the daughters first before you get to Lady Demetrius. I'm thinking Spider Kirby, which is a, a copy ability from the newer games. Yeah. Nah. All right. I'm deleting those. I don't really like them that much. Oh, I hope I have enough undos. I don't know how many undos Medibang has. I don't remember. Oh, come on. Come on. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> I got so scared. Hoi, hello, funny cut. Welcome in. Oh, actually, that's six o'clock. What's edge lighting? I feel like it's kind of obvious, but I want to make sure. So it's just lighting around the edges of stuff. <clears throat> um, it can be kind of hard to get the hang of because you can't just add, like, lighting to the edges of things that it'll look good, right? But, like, you know, there's a little bit of nuance to it, but it's, it's a typically a very easy way to light stuff. It's when you get, like, a very intense kind of light, so, like, uh, white or really bright yellow and you just kind of layer it on a very thick um, layer so you don't blend it in that much. Um, usually it's used when things are from behind, but some people use it when it's like a very intense light coming from somewhere. Some people use it when like the sun is really, really bright in the desert as well. Um, but yeah, it's just lighting around the edges, usually. Transformation tool is slower than evolution. I don't even know what the evolution tool is. I use neither of those. I use Liquify. That's with Photoshop, though. <laughs> it's three for you. Yeah, it is six for me, though. So that means that that is the end of the stream, y'all. Thank you so much for joining once again. If you would like this file and also the lesson that we learned today. So this and this, that will both be JPEGs. Feel free to, you know, join the Discord. And that's where you will be able to see them. And... Um, sorry. <laughs> if you join our social medias, you know, join our Discord, join, <clears throat> um, check out our Instagram, check out the Facebook page. You'll be able to see, um, these pieces, which will go up on our socials after this stream. Um, but the JPEGs will be uploaded to Discord for you to download all for yourselves. So if you'd like those, feel free to download them. Um, and... If you would like the working files, then you're going to have to join our Patreon. Our Patreon is where you can find my working files, which will be uploaded every other week. But the weeks in between those will be our behind the scenes. So you will learn a little bit more about the studio and what we do here um, and what I do here. And you'll learn a little bit more about that kind of process. Um, but if you would like to kind of see a little bit more of me, see a little bit more of our stuff here, be sure to check out our website, which is where you can see our class offerings and blogs, which I also write. And... Um, summer camp which is going to be coming up very soon um but yeah thank you guys so so much for joining y'all i'll see y'all next week bye, -bye.